Well, we are in a series titled Signs. Everybody say Signs. And we take this series um, and this term, Signs, uh, we're, we're pulling out of the book of John, and we almost have just about gone kind of almost chapter to chapter in the gospel of John. John was one of the four disciples that wrote a gospel. Uh, 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 he wrote down and recorded some of the life and teachings of Jesus' time here on the planet as his disciple. And in John chapter 20, and verse 30, he makes this statement towards the end of his record of what Jesus had done. He said, Jesus did many other miraculous signs. Everybody say miraculous signs. Miraculous. That word, that term in and of itself has such um, <clears throat> validation in that he's not just talking about miracles that Jesus did, but he calls them miraculous signs. In other words, what does a sign do? A sign points to something. So Jesus was doing these miraculous signs while training and apprenticing his disciples. So it was more than just doing a miracle, he had lessons that he was teaching in the midst of these conflicts, in the midst of these miracles. And John goes on to say, he goes, but these are written that you may believe. He said, I've written down these particular signs and wonders that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. How many of you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? All right, about half of you, we'll get the rest of you by the end of the day the Son of God, and that by believing, that by believing, you may have life, that you may have life in his name, that you would have, and that word life is not that you would just like, I'm alive, no, that you would have the supernatural essence of who Jesus is flowing in you. That's what this is talking about. So John said, I've given you these seven, I mean, he did so many miracles, he said, I couldn't even record them all if I wanted to. He goes, but these I've honed in on because they point to some life lessons that he was teaching his disciples, thereby teaching us as followers of Jesus. And that by believing in him and seeing what he's done in these passages, we would have his supernatural essence flowing through us. Are you there? Say yes. And so as we jump in today, we've looked at a bunch of different signs. Last week, we looked at sign number five that John records when Jesus walked on water, which is pretty supernaturally cool, and what he was teaching his disciples. Today, we're going to study in John chapter 9 where he heals the blind man. Okay, now this is a lot of scripture, but you keep telling me that you're okay with reading the Bible at church. So that's a cool thing, and, uh, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to read the Word of God. So go ahead and pull out your Bibles, John chapter 9. Turn on your Bible. Go straight to your Bible app, John chapter 9. If you're still reading paper, we beg you to stop killing trees. Um, John chapter 9. I'm just kidding. <laughs> the paper Bible's great. All right, John chapter 9, verse 1. It says, as he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. He says, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And verse 6, having said this, he spit on the ground. <laughs> spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Everybody say gross. Verse se- Not if Jesus does it. What's wrong with y'all? Verse 7, go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which the word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Everybody say seeing. Verse 8, his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Verse 9, some claimed that he was, and others said, no, no way. He only looks like him, but he himself insisted, I'm the man. I'm the man. I am the man. Verse 10, how then were your eyes open, they demanded. Verse 11, he replied, the man they call Jesus. How, how then were your eyes open? Man, I don't know. What's the guy look like? I don't know. I've been blind. All right. How did you, how, the man <laughs> they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and then wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. He says, I don't know. I can't even tell you what he looks like. Verse 13. They brought to the Pharisees, they, excuse me, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him uh, how he received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I wash, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Verse 17, finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, 
I guess he's a prophet. Verse 18, the Jews did not, did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Verse 19, this is your son, they asked. Is this, uh, is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that he now sees? Verse 20, we know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind because we had to take care of him all these years. Verse 21, but how he came to see now or, open, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. Verse 22, his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. Verse 23, that, is what, that's, that was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know is I was blind and now I see. Verse 26, then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Imagine this guy's frustration. Verse 27, he answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple too? Does that not sound like your five-year-old? <laughs> Verse 28, then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple? We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fella, we don't even know where he comes from. Verse 30, the man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opens my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you are steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Verse 36, who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus, verse 37, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Verse 38, then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Yeah. Unbelievable. So give me a second to kind of break this down for you. As we open up in verse 1, it actually opens up by saying, as he went along. Now, that's a really sweet way of the Bible saying, as they hurried to the next place. And the reason why is because if you'll go back, now you understand the Bible has these chapters and verses. But when it's originally written, it's written more like a letter and it doesn't have chapters and verses. We went back and did that so that we could refer to different places of God's holy word. And so in chapter 8, Jesus so fires up the religious leaders that they decide they're going to kill him. They grab stones to stone him to death, not get stoned with him, to stone him to death. They throw rocks up against his head till they crack his skull open and kill him. It was a very violent kind of mob justice kind of thing that would happen periodically in the ancient world. We still see some of that even in some of our, you know, less modern uh, countries. You know, if, if you're ever in a, in, a, in a really, you know, poor country and you get something, get in the village and do something wrong, they're liable to pick up rocks or something and just kill you. And so, and no one will ever know and no one will ever find your body. And so they go to do this with Jesus. And all the Bible says was, he walked through them, through their midst. Now, I love that the Bible is so sweet and kind about that, but basically, one of two things happened in chapter 8. Either Jesus froze them all, and he just went walking past them, dink, dink, or either he did like, you know, uh, uh, what's the guy who runs real fast, one of the Marvel characters? Yeah, so either he did a flash, and he's moving so fast that they don't know what just happened, and they can't find him, and he's going around, you know, switching the hats and moving their arms and things like that. Or either just in a moment, in a moment, he made himself invisible, which is super sick too, right? Like all of a sudden, he's just invisible. Whatever he did, he walked out of their midst, kill him, kill him. Where is he? And so can you imagine the disciples? They've all been in the crowd as their leader is about to get stoned. So they're kind of like, doo -de doo -de doo -de doo -de. And so I would imagine they meet somehow out on the outskirts of town, and they're like, let's get them to the next town. And so they start heading. So as they came into this next place, as they went along, the Bible says that Jesus saw the blind man. This is a beautiful word. It's the Greek word, edu, or I do. And it actually means to know, to be aware of. He sees this man, this blind man who has been suffering with this since birth. Jesus sees him. He doesn't just glance at him, he sees him. And I want to I make this point to you. 
Jesus sees what you're going through. He knows you and your pain. And I know sometimes you don't feel that way. That's why I love that Tasha Cobb song, you know, he knows my name. And I love that old hymn where I walk with him and I talk with him. And he tells me I am his own. I need you to understand that though the enemy lie to you and tell you that he doesn't care about you, that God doesn't know what you're going through, that he's not, he's not, he's not sensitive to your needs, just the opposite is true. He, see, he edus you. He edus you. He sees you down deep in who you are and the pain and the suffering. You say, well, how come he ain't fixing it? Well, because his timing is perfect. Amen. And all things are working together for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. And so your timing and his timing is two different things, and he is doing something in you so that he can do something through you. And so as they see Jesus looking intently into this man, into his soul, the disciples go, hey, can we ask you a a theological question? Who sinned? This man or his parents. You have to understand, in this moment, the Jewish people believed their doctrine was this. If you had something wrong with you, physically, mentally, whatever it may be, it was the result of your sin. And if it wasn't your sin, then it must have been your parents' sin. This was their doctrine. Some of you carry that doctrine. I've had, you, I've had some of you tell me, you know, I ask you, how, how was your week? Oh, pastor, it was a bad week. You know, I hadn't been tithing. And, and so God caused me to wreck my card so he could get my attention. Woo. Ooh, no, 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 sir, no, sir. Well, yeah, 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 no, he's punishing me, but, but, you know, I'm going to do right. No, 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 he loves you. He disciplines those he loves and those butts about it. But he didn't cause your daughter to get raped because you didn't go to church last year. That's not, that's not, that's not his nature. That's not, Jesus said, I came to bring you life and life more abundantly. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. In that love engagement. And, I'll, and, and in that love engagement, something happens to us where we don't want to. The Bible actually says grace teaches us to say no to sin. Grace, because he pours out grace. I don't want to sin against him anymore. I don't want to do, do wrong by him. I want to have a right relationship with him. And so Jesus engages in this concept that they have. And, and, and he literally, in fact, going way back, they even believed in a little bit of transmit, uh, uh, transitional sin. In other words, that had you sinned uh, in another life, that, you could, that could somehow be then transposed onto your grandchildren because of your sin, the punishment thereof. And um, in fact, um, Jamie and I, I'll, I'll never forget, years ago, we had lost our third child. We'd had our third miscarriage in the second trimester, and taking their little bodies in Ziplocs. You've heard me tell this, and, and bringing them up to the hospital. We were, just, we were just destroyed. Like, God, where are you in the midst of our dark hour? And so we went to a conference a couple of weeks. It, it, it couldn't even been two weeks. We, our church had a conference. We had this guy speaking and teaching on family relationships. And, and he was supposedly some expert. And he was well-known across America and the, United, and, the, and the countries of the world. He had some big ministry. He's a single dude who had never been married. And he's teaching on how to, how to be married. And he was teaching on how to raise kids. He never had kids. Older man. And we were sitting there probably about halfway through, and we were just, man, we were just so, so much pain from what we're going through. And he quotes this piece out of the book of Leviticus chapter 20, and he paraphrases what it means that, and he says it like this, I'll never forget as long as I live. He said, and so if you're having miscarriages, it's because you have hidden sin in your life and God's judging you for it. And I had this moment, this out-of-body experience. I actually thought I did this. The anger rose in me so much that I, and I, we were taking notes. In those days, you wrote on paper with a pen. And so I was taking notes. And I saw myself go walking calmly up on the stage. I, I was one of the pastors. Go walking up on the stage, take that pen, stabbing it in his throat as blood comes squirting out and saying, now I have sinned. And walking off the stage as the, as the ushers come running up and grab me and, you know, call the police and all that. And then I came too, and I'm kind of sitting there and I'm like, baby, we need to go right now before something crazy happens. I'm just owning my own sin nature for you for just a moment. <laughs> because of false doctrine, yeah. it creates false actions. These men had no intentions of praying for this blind guy because they were of the belief system that he created his own problem. This false doctrine created these kind of bad actions. In fact, let me just tell you what this false doctrine, guess what, it, guess what the ramifications of this false belief is? Well, the first one is, well, then if I repent of that sin, does that mean I'm going to get healed? Not to mention, what sin do I repent of? Because all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. 
So which of my many sins are the reason why I was born blind? Wait a minute, I, wasn't, I didn't do anything to be born blind, so which of the sins did my mom and dad do that caused me to be blind? And if they can't remember which sin it is, then do I ever get to get healed? Wait a minute, they've repented of all their sins that they know of, and I'm still not healed, so what's wrong with God and what's wrong with me? Are you, mad? Are you seeing what false doctrine creates? So this bad doctrine creates it. Not only that, but then there's no reason to ask God to help them because they haven't truly repented, and that's why they can never really be healed. Yeah. And so they've repented, and they've gone to church, and they've tried to serve the Lord, but yet they still got this problem. But our doctrine is that, you know what, if you've got a problem, then that means God's mad at you. And so when does God stop being mad at me? How long do I have to suffer? Because my mama used to make me, my mama didn't, but you might would say, my mama used to make me pay when she got mad at me. She would isolate me and not speak to me for a month at a time. So is that how my God is? See what these false teachings will do and create in your mind? And so you, don't, you can't come running boldly into the throne of grace because you have an ideology that you are bad, and so therefore you have to pay for your badness for how long? For how long? And this is, this is what they were dealing with. And Jesus says, are you out of your ever-living mind? Adam McCain paraphrase. Neither one of these is, and the message Bible, I believe, gets it right. In John chapter 9 and verse 3, Jesus answered, the message Bible, I believe, paraphrase it right. When they say, Jesus said, you are asking the wrong question. You're looking for someone to blame. There is no such cause and effect here. Look instead for what God can do. And can I just tell you something? We, We get into these moments, we've got to blame somebody. And so it's not happening for me. My husband's still a jerk. Who did wrong by me? And so because we get into this false understandings, we have false and bad, if you will, responses to that. And so as a result, they're not going to pray for this guy. They're not going to do anything. And Jesus corrects them and says, listen, you're looking for someone to blame. You think that this caused this. You got this all wrong. This is a moment for God to have come on the scene and do something supernatural. While we have the moment, let's take advantage of the moment. Instead of looking for someone to blame, how about we just jump into this? Because sin entered the world when Adam and Eve rebelled against the God, the God in, in, the, in the garden. And as a result, every demonic force in hell has been unleashed on the people of God. God on humanity, and we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and instead of sitting around who to blame physically and who to blame, you know, relationally, how about we just recognize that the real enemy is a, is a demonic force that has been released onto the planet and into all of our lives, and let's stand against them, and let's do the work of God while we have time. This is what Jesus says. And so what does he do? He spits on the ground. Now, The reason why this is significant, and John hones in on it, is because the Jewish leaders believed that there was something medicinal in spit. And so if Jesus spits on the ground and makes mud, then he's actually acting like a doctor of their time somehow. And he's doing that on the Sabbath. And they have so taken the honor the Sabbath and make it holy and keep it holy, they've so taken it to the extreme that they've taught the people, the Jewish leaders of the time have taught the people, you cannot, you cannot do any work because if you get, do some work, you might get hurt. And if you get hurt, then you're doing all of this exertion during the Sabbath when you're supposed to be resting. And so there would be no medical hospitals open on the Sabbath. By way, of, There would be no doctor that you should go see if something happened to you on the Sabbath. God's either going to heal you or you're going to die because it's the Sabbath and we can't do anything. So with Jesus healing this man on the Sabbath, he has enraged them again that you're disobeying your leadership. That you're disobeying. And so when he spits on the ground, and he puts the mud on the guy's eyes, and then he tells him, go and wash. Everybody say, go and wash. wash. Here's the point I want to make from this. The man has a choice. He knows by going and washing on the Sabbath that he's going to be accused of breaking social protocols. He's going to be accused of even being unspiritual, of being rebellious, But there comes a moment where you have to obey Jesus instead of all the social protocols. If we're not living in that era, I don't know when we're living. I'm just going to obey Jesus. If he does not obey Jesus, he does not get healed. So he goes to this pool, the pool of Siloam. 
And this pool was a, was a pool that they used for, you know, much of their, you know, traditional washing and cleansing, you know, moments and things like that. He washes and he comes back. And the moment that he washes and comes home, he can see. It's a miracle. And it's such a miracle that the people where he lives, the people where he camps out, now he's been put out in front of, you know, he's been put out in front of Walmart for the, for the last 30 years of his life to beg. Alms for the poor. Alms for the poor. Somebody help a blind guy. I mean, so he's out there, whatever his little plan is, whatever he's doing to get people to give so he can survive. His parents have been kind of like, hope you work, hope it works out for you. You're, you're an adult now. And this man has had to figure out a way to hustle to survive through life. Jesus heals him, and the people that know him and see him are divided. They are divided as to whether it's really him. Why are they divided? They've seen him for years. Why are they divided? Because Jesus didn't just heal his eyes. He healed his heart. He healed his confidence. He healed everything about him. So this man's countenance has changed. This man's countenance has changed. It's not that he can just see. He looks different. His nature is different. That old blind, depressed guy, oh, woe is me. Woe is me. It's now the guy like, dude, woo! Anybody want to play football? I don't even know what it looks like. Let's go. I mean, this guy's whole nature, his whole countenance has changed. And this is the reason why I want you to catch this, because one miraculous engagement with Jesus will change everything about you. And so that's why it's wicked for the enemy to lie to you and to teach you and try to get you to believe a false doctrine that God doesn't move in the supernatural anymore, that he doesn't do miracle signs and wonders in this day. Why? Because the moment any human has a connection with a real miracle, it, sh it, it shifts everything. I've had multiple miracles in my life that have shifted everything. I am in the ministry today because of the miracles of God. Because I said, if this is real, then I'll follow you to the ends of the earth and back. And I'll give you everything. Instead of chasing after the American dream, I'll chase after the heavenly dream. And that is to seek and save that which is lost. Every one of those miracles that I've experienced and my family has experienced, all it does is undergird this trust that I have that he will never leave me or forsake me. He will not abandon me. Even in my brokenness, he will come to me. He sees me and he heals me because he loves me. Are you with me today? Say yes. Oh, you're not with me. Are you with me today? Say yes. The moment that this guy obeys, boom, supernatural things happen. Had he not obeyed, it would have nullified the thing that God was doing. I'll never forget sitting in a small group years ago, some buddies, and, uh, and this one guy had been with us for six months, nine months, and you, you know, his marriage was just a mess. And we were pretty sure that, that she wasn't going to stay with him. And one day, as we're sitting around, we had some time of prayer, just a group of guys in the living room, uh, you know, just kind of doing small group life. And in this moment, God had gotten a hold to him. And this guy opens up, he goes, guys, I just want to confess something. I think we had been teaching on the scripture that says, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. And, uh, and he said, you know what? I just need to, I just need to own this. Um, I'm addicted to porn. And I think it's the thing that's destroying my relationship with my wife. I don't know if she knows, but I just know that there's, there's not intimacy between the two of us. And I think it says it. And I just, it's wicked and I don't want it. And I don't want to be like this. We all pray for me. And so, you know, we were like, yeah, Jesus, and we pray for him. Something broke in the moment of him obeying what the scripture says to confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. Because he obeyed that, something shifted. It's hardly to even under, explain. Within a matter of two to three months, they didn't go to counseling. They didn't have any big come to Jesus moment. It just, it blossomed into one of the most beautiful marriages in our entire congregation at the time. Why? Because he obeyed the word of the Lord. And I would say to some of you, you're not having the miracles that you seek because you're not obeyed the word of the Lord. As you move on, Jesus, after he's healed this guy, and, the, and everybody, John takes the next like 20-something verses, not to talk about the healing or the miracle, but to talk about all the thing that transpired as a result. And, and Jesus is literally teaching his apprentices. He's showing his disciples what's going to happen with these miracle signs and what, what's gonna, what you're going to go through, what needs to happen. And so this man, who's now can see, they bring him to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees said, how in the world did this happen? Well, this guy, Jesus, did it. He spit, he spit, he made mud, and healed you. On the Sabbath, 
you know what that means, right? He's a sinner. So how could a sinner do this? Man, I don't know. All I know was once I was blind, and now I see. Can I help you with something? You don't have to fix all the bad theology in the world. You don't have to get everybody at work and everybody in your family to kind of argue with all of their little misunderstandings and argument and falsehood. All you need to do is say, listen, all I know, all I know is I was wicked and I couldn't stop being wicked. Jesus came into my life and my marriage is back together. My kids love me. I love them. All I know is once I was blind and now I see. I can't tell you all the ins and outs. I can't tell you what Genesis says. I don't even read the book of Revelation because it scares the poop out of me. But this I know is I used to be wicked and now I'm not. This I know. I used to have a drug addiction and now I don't. All I know is that Jesus did something in me. I can't all, uh, articulate all of it. All I know is once I was blind and now I see. That's the greatest testimony in the world is what you've experienced, not what everybody else wants to argue about. Are you with me? Say yes. And so they're trying to argue with this guy. Now they have spent their lives studying the Bible. They have spent their life. They have become experts in the law. And they want to argue with this. Little, he's been blind. Do you think in ancient times they had blind school? Can he read? Can he write? He's got street smarts because he's lived on the streets begging his whole life. But he doesn't have an education. And these highly educated people want to argue with him and intimidate him. And I love what transpires in this thing. You can be highly educated. That's so good. That's so, oh, I'm so proud of you. But if you've never met Jesus, you don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to truth. <laughs> Bottom line. So he gets into this thing, and they argue the point. In fact, if you'll go back and read, we won't do it for sake of time, but all through this chapter, verses all the way from 12 to 31, do you know what goes back and forth? We know. We know that he can't be like this, and we know this, and we know this, but we don't know this, and we don't know that, and we don't know this. But we, how, how would he be able to do that? How can you say that? And he says, I don't know, but I know this. And the parents go, we don't know, but we know this. The whole, the whole 30, 20 verses are like, no, don't know, no, don't know, no. Can I just tell you, at the end of the age, the only thing that will matter is do you know Jesus? Because the Bible says it very clearly when he's talking about that moment of judgment day. He says he tells those group of people, depart from me, I never knew you but didn't we prophesy in your name didn't we cast out but yeah maybe I don't know because I don't know you back in the day when you'd go to clubs you know how you got in the club it wasn't about how much money you had how well you address it did you know the guy at the door that was letting people in do you know Jesus that's what this whole thing's going to be is all about is do you know him do you have a relationship with him? And so Jesus stays out at a distance. They get in all of this back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And finally, they get so frustrated with this guy because they can't get this guy to humble himself and submit to their false theology. And so they just kick him out of the church. Now, you have to understand, when they kick him out, when they, when they throw him out, the Bible uses the term throw him out, what they're throwing him out of is the synagogue. Now, what that would be like, that would be like a black dude who's gotten thrown out of the black community. Unity. Or, or, or a Jewish person, because everything about their life is centered around everything, everything socially, spiritually, everything financially is all about their group, about being Jewish, going to the synagogue. If you get kicked out of the synagogue, come on, it'd be like being excommunicated, those of you that are formerly Catholic. And the fear, and grandma is like, you got excommunicated? You're like, have you, what did you do? And that's what's happened. So this man no longer has a social life with his, with his brothers and sisters that are Jewish. He's been excommunicated. He's been kicked out by the Jewish leaders. Jesus goes and finds him. Because what dead religion kicks you out of, Jesus will come and embrace you in true life. And he says to him, he confirms the man. He confirms him. And he says, what you're looking for is right here in front of you. What you've always wanted, I am him. And the Bible says that he falls down, and he begins to worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Here's the life lessons I want you to take from this. You guys have been so great today. Let me give you a few life, life lessons. Write these down from this passage. Here's the first thing that Jesus is teaching his disciples, and he's teaching you and me, and that is, number one, stop blaming and start ministering. Stop blaming and start ministering. Okay, yeah, right, right. You know, your last pastor did that. Now, now let's stop blaming and start ministering. Who sinned? That pastor, me, my wife, who sinned? Jesus like, this is the wrong question. People are dying and going to hell around you. I'll work all that out at Judgment Day. Right now, let's just get about ministering while we have light. 
In fact, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8 says, the, son, the reason the Son of Man appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Pastor Jamie was working with the staff this week, and she was teaching us from a book called Critical, or excuse me, Crucial Conversations. And it's a, it's a, it's a leadership book. And, uh, and, and in that, the author tells each and everyone reading, he says, what happens to many of us is we always have to have one of three things. We either, we, either, uh, we either make someone our victim, or we make someone the villain, or we make it hopeless. There's, it's what we do. And, and we play this in our mind, and we play these storyboards in my, our mind. We're the victim. They're, they're the villain. And the whole thing is hopeless. And that is, listen to me, that is a cycle that many of us have gotten into. And Jesus is breaking that off of his disciples. And he's saying, listen, we ain't got time for worried about who's the victim, who's the villain. It's not hopeless. The son of God is here. All I have to do is spit in the mud, put it on, put the mud on his eyes, and this boy will be able to see, although he's never been able to see before. God is in the house. Are you with me today? Say yes. God wants to heal your coworkers. God wants to fix your neighbor. I know they're a bunch of Karens or whatever they may be. God I will fix them simply because he's brought you into relationship with them. And instead of being blaming and victimizing and vilifying everybody, how about you just realize, you know what? Once I was blind and now I see I got life to give to everybody else. Stop blaming and start ministering. Somebody say amen. All right, we almost got you there. Number two, here's the second life lesson. And that is we have a part to play in our own healing. We have a part to play in our own healing. I'm just waiting on God. God's waiting on you. I'm just waiting on the Lord to do it. Well, maybe he's waiting on you. What did he tell you to do? You know what hinders most of the church, most of the members of the body of Christ from moving in the supernatural and having these amazing experiences with their God? Is that he told most of us, will not obey, where he tells us, and if your brother sins against you, go to them. Don't post about them. Go to them. And where he says, forgive those who sinned against you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. You say, I ain't doing it. Exactly. Keep your blindness then. That, that, you have a part to play in your healing. Listen, I can give you storyline after storyline where the Lord would come to me and say, you have not made this right. And, and literally, I wanted him so much and I wanted to be right with him so bad that I was willing to humble myself and go and make that right with a brother who did me dirty. It was, they did it. I didn't do nothing. I didn't do anything. They did it. But to make that right so that we could have the supernatural flow of God happening in our midst. You and I, when we come into obedience, you, will, you can't stop what God wants to do when you come into obedience. It's that simple. Here's the third big piece I would teach you from this life lesson, and that is when the marginalized encounter Jesus, the world knows about it. The world knows about it. When those who've been broken and undone and pushed aside and stepped on, when they come to have a real relationship with Jesus, they can't help but say, he, he healed me. He fixed me. And what's that guy talking about over there? Once I was blind, and now I see in the religious leaders who did this. How dare you? Get everybody's attention over here on what you, you don't even have good theology. Oh, really? You want to become his disciple too? What? When the marginalized finally have encounters with, this is why he calls us to the hurting and the broken to go love on them and show them the love of God. And they come into a right relationship with Jesus Christ. And you can't shut them up. You can't shut them up. They win the whole world to Jesus. And you and I are like, well, maybe not so loud. Years ago, I was on an airplane and this kid got on the airplane, and I've told this story before, and he, he got on the airplane, and they set him in between me and my buddy, and uh, we, I've been preaching all weekend. Man, I've been doing all these conferences, moving and healing, supernatural, and I'm just tired. I'm like, dude, I don't want to pray for nobody else. I don't want to talk to nobody else. From this point forward, until I get refreshed, everybody can burn. I mean, I just don't have time for it. I'm exhausted. Somebody else can minister to him. And this 16-year-old comes walking up. You know, he's got his little headphones turned inside out, you know, and effing blank and beep, effing blank and beep is coming all through his headphones, you know. He's like he's a little DJ or something. He's got his little hat sideways kind of thing. 
And he sits down in between us, man, and I'm not even giving him the ounce of day. I'm just, I'm, I'm acting like I'm asleep. I'm trying to be asleep. And, uh, and so we end up, my buddy ends up in a conversation with him. The guy tries to pretend like he's saved and he's not saved. And when he does that, I just kind of come alive and I tell him, I said, bro, you are not a Christian. He goes, yes, I am. I said, no, you're not. Yes, I am. No, you're not. And so I finally just smack him with the truth. And in that moment, he, he sees it. He goes, oh, oh my God, pray for me right now. I'm like, okay, pray this prayer. Jesus come on. Jesus come on. It's the whole plane. We're going to have to get the whole plane saved, bro. Because he was so, he was so boisterous. And he was just so excited about truth. The 16-year-old finally for the first, he'd been going to church, but he never knew Jesus. And in that moment, he met Jesus. And listen, he's telling everybody, y'all need to talk to that guy right there. He just helped me find Jesus. I'm like, nah, listen, y'all talk to him. I am tired. <laughs> when the marginalized encounter Jesus, the world will know about it. So instead of, instead of being so mad about you got to go to Thanksgiving with your crackhead cousin, maybe you're the answer that he needs to encounter Jesus because once crackhead cousin encounters Jesus, do you know how many people are going to come to Christ? You know how many people's lives are going to be changed? Because they're like, if God can do that with crackhead Kenny, what can he do for me? Do you understand that? You're a living testimony. That's why we got to walk in obedience because they're watching your marriage going, <laughs> y'all are still together? No way. How did that happen? Once we were blind. And now we see. That's all we know. That's all we know. That brings me to the last and final piece, and that is this. Here's the last and final lesson that I would say that I see in this that Jesus is doing and pointing us towards, and that is knowing the Jesus of the doctrine is superior to knowing the doctrine. I'll let that hit for a second. Yeah. Knowing the Jesus of the doctrine. I work at a Bible school throughout the week, and it's amazing how these, these young and even older leaders are trying to, they're going to Bible school because they want to be ministers and teachers of the word and that kind of stuff. And it's amazing how quickly we can get so um, down into learning about Jesus that we formerly, that we don't know him anymore. That we don't know him. I tell this all the time. Years ago, I had the experience of uh, ministering to Shaquille O'Neal. I was out witnessing around LSU, greatest football team in the world, who just beat Alabama. Anyway, so um, so so I'm out there around LSU at about one o'clock in the morning. I'm out there preaching, and I come around the corner, and there in front of me are these three huge black dudes sitting there talking. They're you know they're pounding back you know long necks and stuff. And so I walk up to them, and as I'm standing up, the guy sitting down is still taller than me. Like, I know I'm short, but that's something freaky right there. Like, how is that happening? He's sitting on some stairs, you know, of this, of this uh, apartment complex and stuff. And, and so as, I, as I'm talking to him, it hits me. This is Shaquille O'Neal. His feet are that big. I've never seen anything like it. It, it blew my mind. And so I just, I just straight up said, hey, Shaq, man, listen, uh, um, uh, man, wow, I'm a big fan. I said, listen, I'm just out here telling people about Jesus, bro, because one day we're all going to die. And then we're going to give an account for our lives. And so, bro, I just don't want anybody to, to spend eternity separated from Jesus. I don't want them to be in hell for the rest of their lives. And so, bro, the Bible says it's appointed once for man to die, and then the judgment, then we'll be judged. And so I, I'm just out here, you know, asking people, do you want to get right with God? When you think about eternity, do you want to be right with God now? Make a decision for him now. And Shaq is so cool like he always is, you know. He goes, man, my mom's raised me in church, but I'll be honest with you. He's so funny. He goes, I'm having too much fun right now. I don't want to serve God. I know what's right, but I don't want to. I was like, cool, man. I said, can I at least pray for you? He was like, yeah. He bowed his head. I'm like, I'm praying for Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> this is before iPhones, because I've been like, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, right now. Fuego del Espíritu Santo. <laughs> we called down fire on him or something. And, uh, now, let me just say this. If you walked up the shack, somehow, you know, you know, you're John and you get, you know, get to see him behind the scenes somewhere at some, you know, Dallas Cowboys thing or something. And you walk up to him, you say, Shaquilla, Shaq, hey, my name is so-and-so. My pastor, Adam McCain, he was just talking about, you know him? Shaq would be like, what? No, no, like, like when you were sitting down, you were saying, he walked up to you and prayed for you and stuff. You're like, my mom's, you're like, what are you talking about? See, I've met him, but I don't know him. I've watched interviews with him. I've read articles about him. 
but I don't know him. I know people's opinion of him, but I don't know him. People can study doctrine and not know the God of the doctrine. And when you know him, then all of a sudden what people translate and they said about him, you go like, that ain't him. I'm, I know him. That's not him. Oh, uh, no, no, no. I appreciate your doctrine. No, no. God didn't pick who was going to go to hell and who was going to heaven. And he's chosen those of you that need to be raped so he can teach you a lesson. That's not, that's, that's not, that's not the God I know. That's not my Jesus. That's not the one. I know him personally. And so that's why at this church I'm constantly pushing you, know him. Know him. I give you, I give you, I give you, we give you like these pathways to, to get closer and closer. And how do you know him? Just like you know a spouse, just like you know a son or a daughter. You spend time. That's why we, we don't get you to come to church because it makes me feel good about how many people are here. I want you to be around the other believers. And as they're saying, well, he just, he did this for me. You're like, wow, okay, I'm going to ask him for that. And as you begin to grow in him, you begin to know him, you start acting like him. And you start changing because, because you're hanging out with him. And anybody you hang out with, you start acting like him. Let's tell the truth. All you gringos start hanging out with your Hispanic friends. And you start trying to roll your R's. You're like, yeah, man, I thought you were right now, man. That's cool, man. That's cool. And you don't even know you're doing it. Why? Because you spend the time. Are you with me? Say yes. These are the great things that Jesus is pointing to, and his disciples get it. I'd also point out this. While this guy is trying to stand up for the experience that he just had with Jesus, where's the disciples at? They're not running up in there and saying, hey, my Jesus did that. Let's go. They're not doing any of that. Why? Because they've been in so church so long that their experience with Jesus has become common to them. And I would challenge those of us that know Jesus a lot and spend a lot of time with him. May we stop holding it all to ourselves and make sure the hurting and the dying. May we see the blind. May we see them and know them just like our Jesus would yeah. and just like he does. Stand with me all across the room. I want to pray over you. We've got to close out our time. You guys have been magnificent. Thank you for letting me share the word with you. We're growing, amen? amen. I want to be more like Jesus. That's the only thing I'm after. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. And I, I just do that so you can concentrate. I, I always tell you, we don't send little elves around to steal stuff out of your purse while you're not looking. This is, this is so you can have a moment with the Lord. I just want you to concentrate. I want you to, we're in the presence of the believers. We've gathered today on Sunday. This is not the church. This is a meeting of the church. You are the church. This building's not the church. This service is not the church. This is a gathering of the church. So as you're standing here in the presence of other believers, he's very clear. He says, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be in the midst of you. So he's here in our midst. And here's what I want you to do with your head bowed and your eye closed. Would you let him minister to you for just a moment? I want you to picture that no one else is in the room. Whatever you have to do to kind of get a face-to-face -face mental experience with your God. Because he's, he loves you. He's here in our midst. And here's what I want you to ask him. Say, Lord, Lord, what do I need to experience to see the miracles I'm asking for? You might want to ask him, Lord, where am I not obeying you? Did you show me something and I missed it? Lord, Lord, what, what do you have need of me? I want you to picture those coworkers, those neighbors that frustrate you so much. And I want you to see them like Jesus see, sees them. I want you to ask the Lord to help you see them like he's, to know them, to know their pain, to understand them, that you may be able to bring them life, the life that's been brought to you. Jesus, we come before you as a congregation, as a group of believers who love you, Daddy. And Lord, we recognize that our sinfulness, our sinfulness, Lord God, does not push you away from us. You run to us. You love us. Who sinned? Asking the wrong question. God wants to do miracles in the midst of brokenness. And so, Lord, I'm asking you to do miracles in us. And Lord God, free us from the blame game and always vilifying somebody. Lord, we just want to be free from that right now so that we can minister properly. Lord, would you just help us, Lord God? Would you just do a work in us here and now, Lord God? We humble ourselves. We pray. Just under your breath, I just want you to pray. Just in your mind's eye, in your heart of hearts, cry out to your God. Say, God, I, I'm tired of always vilifying everybody. I'm tired of always being the victim. We live in a culture now that everyone has to be a victim to have a voice. 
Jesus, I ask you right now to heal us so that we can be salt and light for our generation. Deliver us from false teachings, oh God, so that we can walk in the power that you walked in, so that we can see cities transform for you and businesses transform for you and families transform and individuals transform. As you keep your head bowed and your eye closed, I want to give a call with a few minutes I have left. To those of you that might say, Pastor, i got to be honest. If I died today, I don't think I'd go to heaven. Man, I have been there. That's a, it's a pretty miserable state, but i got some good news. You're here. You're watching with us online. You've engaged with us. No one, no one tricked you. You didn't think you were going to a club this morning. Like, oh, my God, I thought this was a club. So, so your heart's open to God or you wouldn't have come here. In fact, if I had to guess, you probably... You probably aren't serving God simply because of the shame of your own sin. And can I just give you some other good news? The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that he will forgive you. He will cleanse you, the Bible says, from all unrighteousness. Your obedient step is not to go give money to the poor or join the church. Your obedient step is to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Admit that he's the Lord and Savior of your life and give yourself completely to him and he will forgive you and cleanse you. And the Bible actually says he accepts you as a son or a daughter. In fact, I would say this to you. He's been chasing you for weeks, months, years now, trying to get your attention, trying to show you his love. And I would beg you, don't push it away today. Don't push him away again today. Receive the love that Jesus has for you. Humble yourself. Let him be the Lord of your life. Repent of your sins. Recognize your wickedness. And ask for the Savior to heal you and fix you. So today, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'd like to lead you in a prayer of repentance. A prayer of dedicating your life to God. A prayer of surrendering yourself to Jesus as Lord and Savior. With no one looking around, you say, Pastor, that's me. I don't want to live like this anymore. I want to repent of my sins. I want Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I want to surrender myself to him. With no one looking around. I'd like to pray for you. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. But I need to know who I'm leading in a prayer of repentance and dedication to the Lord. So if that's you, you say, Pastor, pray for me. It's time. I'm ready to get right with God. Would you just slip your hand up so I know who I'm praying with? Okay, yes, ma'am. Anyone else? God bless you. Yes, sir. Give you a couple more seconds. Anyone else? Amen. Thank you for your honesty. I love honest and real people. Oh, I love just authentic. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. I'll, I'll never forget when I threw up my hand. I'll never forget. Everything changed that day. Amen. Anybody else? Give you two more seconds. Make sure I see it. Okay, you can put your hands down. Yes, sir. You can put your hands down. I'm going to lead you in this prayer of repentance, prayer of surrendering your life to Jesus. And I want you to mean it from the depths of your heart. In fact, I'm going to ask you to pray it out loud, repeat it out loud with me. And in fact, I'm going to ask the whole congregation to do the same. So as you pray it out, I want you to mean it from the depths of your heart. You ready? Say it like this. Say, Jesus, today I admit I'm a sinner and I recognize... I've been sinning against you, but here and now, I repent of my sins. I turn away from them. I change my mind. I don't want to live like this. Jesus, I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for mercy and grace. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit. Write my name in your book of life. I'm yours forever in Jesus' name. Keep your head bowed for just a moment. Father, I pray right now there would be a peace that would overtake those who threw up their hand and cried out to you. Lord, that peace that comes, Lord, your word talks about the perfect peace. Lord God, that comes because you know what? There's not an elephant in the room anymore. They're not running from you anymore. They're, they're 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 not ashamed to call on your name. Lord, they just they just surrendered themselves to you. And Lord, I pray that in the result of that would be this joy. The Bible calls it the joy of our salvation. And Lord, they're not gonna be perfect. And Lord God, when they sin and they fail in the days to come, or remind them, they're not perfect, they're forgiven. There's a real difference. And that you're working in them. And the more they, the more they spend time with you, the more they hang out with you, the more, more they consume your holy scriptures, Lord God, they'll start being like you. And, and the old temptations will lose its luster. And the, and the old bad habits will just kind of lose its power over them as they just continue to fall in love with you daily. And Jesus, I ask you, I ask you for Hill City to be a church a congregation of men and women, Lord God, who are just loving you. Not perfect, but loving you. We are your followers. We are your disciples. 
We are your apprentices, Lord God. Teach us, show us your ways that we may walk uprightly all of our days and that we may change the world around us one hurting soul at a time. And everyone who believes said amen and amen. Can we applaud all that God's done? Amen, so good. Joining us online here at Hill City, we're so honored that you would take the time to join us remotely and to celebrate the goodness of Jesus. I hope that word spoke to you. I hope that you were blessed today and I hope that you are encouraged to go forth in the confidence of Jesus this week wherever you are. If you made a decision today uh, to serve Jesus for the first time, we want to celebrate with you. Would you text DECIDED to 469-606-2684? And uh, we want to respond and again, just connect with you and celebrate the beginning of an amazing discipleship journey with Jesus. Don't forget, next week we are here again, same place, same time, 9 o'clock and 11. And until then, we hope you have an amazing week.